Hi guys, uh, just a little update on the uh, video I made recently uh, demonstrating um, an Amiga 500, or I should say uh, a Mr. FPGA or DE10 Nano uh, installed inside an Amiga 500 plus case. Uh, this one, in fact. And uh, when I showed it on the uh, the last video, there were a couple of bits I hadn't quite finished. Uh, one of which was the, uh, the drive LED. So that's just here. Now, obviously that normally gets it signaling through the keyboard connector, just here. But um, because we're going through an Arduino, uh, which doesn't carry the signaling, or it's not configured to, what I'm doing is I'm actually taking the, uh, the signaling for the drive LED straight off the, uh, the Mr. IO board. And you can see there we're splitting it out into see these two connectors here and running those round to another LED just here rather than reusing the existing LED. Now what I've done is I've put a, a small blanking color to stop the, uh, the light from the LED here that I'm using for the drive light, so the, uh, the green LED in this case, from shining through and, uh, and wiping out the power LED, which is a red one. Now I know actually that's possibly the wrong way round, but this is quite an old keyboard, so by default it had a red LED, and uh, rather than add another red one for the drive LED, which I know technically would have been correct on an older 500, um, I decided to go for the green. Uh, but, you know, personal preference, you could use whatever you want, obviously. It just happens that the uh, the green is rated at 3.3 volts, which is exactly the uh, the right um, voltage for the output on the uh, the drive connector here. Uh, I could have used something else. I could have used you know a two volt um, LED and then just put a a resistor in line. But um, anyway, save me the trouble. <laughs> Saves a couple of minutes of soldering. So the other thing that I hadn't done um, when I last demonstrated this was install the uh, the GoTech. What I'd said I intended to do was take uh, one of the USBs, which possibly could have been an additional one with a, a two-port hub, or the other option was to lose the uh, the Bluetooth dongle because I don't really need that. Um, so I've basically taken a 3D printed GoTech bracket, uh, which I've chopped down so that I don't have to uh, sacrifice too much space and I can pretty much leave the keyboard controller where it was. Uh, that's the relatively easy part, and then that gives me a blanking plate for the um, the floppy eject button and kind of covers up most of the uh, the free space that you'd see through the uh, the floppy hatch or the floppy access port whatever you want to call it um, but mounting a USB in the right place so it pops out of the uh, the floppy hole is trickier than you might think so um, I might forgo that because it was only a bit of a nice to have and since I've already got USB poking out of the back, uh, if I ever need to plug a USB drive in it's it's easy enough and because we'll be keeping the Bluetooth uh, and the Wi-Fi I can easily copy stuff to and from it via the, uh, the network. So. Okay so uh, just a couple of other points that um, that I haven't finished on the, uh, the previous video so uh, you can see that these two unused ports on the uh, on the back of the machine have now got blanking covers on them uh, they're just made out of black card, nothing uh, nothing special there. Uh, other than that, oh, I've turned the uh, the USB ports round to uh, to the normal orientation because they were actually upside down, not that it made much difference, but uh, just to keep things neat and tidy. Uh, other than that, it's all the same as was. And we can see, if I come around this side of the machine, that now we've got the, uh, the GoTech uh, blanking plate installed, so it's just a a cut down GoTech bracket actually um, and again uh, wherever possible I've put some uh, blanking card in there just to keep things neat and tidy. So let's just shift the machine back a fraction. Okay so it's worth mentioning perhaps that to uh, power the machine on and off I'm just using this external switch. Obviously the Amiga uh, never actually had a power switch as such. He used to turn it on and off using the, uh, the PSU. So that's kind of a comparable solution, I guess. If I power this machine up, I've got a 
few other inputs on the machine, so. Okay. So that's powered up and I've configured the uh, the mister to boot straight into the uh, Amiga core or the Mini MiniMig core. So the idea here obviously is to make it as seamless as possible. And you can see now we've got our drive light flashing there. And the shielding that I showed on the uh, earlier section of the video seems to be doing its, its job fairly well so uh, when it's accessing the drive it's uh, it's not wiping out the uh, the power led okay and i've built a fresh image for the amiga so this is now running amiga os uh, 3.2 and sorry about the camera work okay and what well, we can see there amiga workbench release 3.2 and if i go into about you can see it's also using the uh, 3.2 rom as well so that's about as up to date as it possibly can be i've changed a few of the icons around uh, you can see we've got the uh, the new shell icon and the new disk icons there and for our temp folder uh, which is on our system folder we're using the uh, the new trash can um, icon as well okay so um, one other thing that uh, that might be worth a quick look um, for those of you that were interested uh, possibly in uh, in accessing old school uh, BBS services uh, albeit uh, via telnet over the uh, over the internet as opposed to dial-up then uh, there's an option to do that, obviously. So we've got our underlying uh, PPP listener um, on the uh, the Linux host, enabling us to use our IP stack. In this case, we're using Roadshow for the IP stack, but in theory, you could use pretty much anything uh, as long as it supports PPP. So if we go into our Telnet client, so in this case, we're using uh, AmTelnet uh, version two, which I don't have a key for, so I have to permanently continue testing, but never mind. Okay, and if we just use, let's see what we've got, bbs.interlinked.us or any other that you care to mention. So if we connect to that, okay, and let's just log in. Voila, there you go. So we're now connected online. In fact, if I just zoom that in a little bit. Okay, so that is effectively an old school BBS, but connecting to it via telnet over the internet. Um, just a little plug for this. This is actually quite a, quite a good BBS. If you're uh, into war games, we go in to get the uh, the game session on here, and we can see W for for Whopper. It'll give you a a kind of simulation. Is there much else to show you? Probably not. I think the rest of it's pretty much as is. So Dopus, there you go. That's still working. Sysinfo, obviously that won't have changed. So that's going to give us our consistent 0.71 times the speed of a, an A4000. Okay internet okay so actually it's worth pointing this out um, <laughs> looks like it's a fail but it's not really so it's failed to uh, to connect and there's a reason for that um, sometimes it takes just a few seconds for the uh, the Wi-Fi dongle to initialize and because we're booting straight into Amiga OS Amiga OS will sometimes have started before the Wi-Fi actually connects. Um, so two ways to overcome that. Either don't boot straight into Amiga OS and come up to the uh, the Mr. Menu, give it a chance to connect to, uh, to the Wi-Fi network and then continue <clears throat> to launch the core. Uh, well, three ways potentially. That's one. Uh, two is to um, connect up uh, an Ethernet adapter and, and use that instead because that's likely to connect a little quicker than the uh, the Wi-Fi. And option three is just don't worry about it. And if you need to get out onto the internet um, in the unlikely event that you ever do, just go and reset the PPP adapter 
and reset the core. Obviously, the majority of the time you're going to be working offline, so it's really not that much of a chore, um, but it's just something to bear in mind. So now, if we go into a web, yeah, there you go. So we're connected. Uh, and as I mentioned on the previous video, it's never going to be lightning speed because it's going out through the underlying PPP uh, interface on the uh, the Linux host, but it works. Okay, a um, couple of other things I'll just highlight so we're using hippo player as the mod player uh, originally I was running version 2.45 I found that whilst that would run under Amiga OS 3.2 it wouldn't actually let me quit so I could load up um, or open up a mod file and play it but I couldn't stop it and I couldn't quit the app uh, whereas 2.47 to 2.47 which is updated version doesn't appear to have the same issue so if we just go and find well, there you go in on to our favorite mod file play that okay got the volume down on the monitor we should turn that up a fraction Okay, and if I pause it, it does actually work, so that's all good. Then um, this is worth pointing out as well. So iGame, um, that was demonstrated on a previous video on, on the, um, the 3.1 build or 3.10 build. And it works fine um, on that build as well. However, the one thing that never did work, not for me anyway, um, was the... Uh, the, the artwork uh, preview, I, all I would ever get uh, would be this iGame image and uh, I'd never see the previews. Now it's possibly that um, just one of the MCC files was out of date or something like that, don't know. Uh, didn't think I'd done anything differently um, when I installed it this time round. Um, and I did actually build this image from scratch, it wasn't an upgrade from uh, 3.1, it's a clean install. But now, if I click on the uh, on the games, I am actually getting the artwork, which is a bit of a Brucey bonus. So all these games will launch and run. Um, but there's one thing to point out here, I think. So if we were to run, I don't know, let's say Zool, and this is this is an AGA game. Yeah, it's okay, it's going to win to my slaves out of date. We can ignore that. That's not causing us any major problems. So it will run quite happily, but it won't fill the full screen. And the reason it won't fill the full screen is because we're running this um, particular image in PAL mode. Oh, it does there, incidentally. But you'll see when we get into the main stay of the game, when we get there, That there's a little bit of blank space top and bottom of the screen now it's not a big deal and it's perfectly playable so for the most part you, you probably wouldn't worry about it but bear with me on this all right so if we quit out of there print screen to get us out um let's take another example something like buggy boy Okay, now you can see here, that's only utilizing about two thirds of the screen. Now the game will play fine, albeit possibly a little fast. Yeah, quite fast. I mean, you could, you could play it, but it it is really a bit fast. Okay, so, We'll quit out of there.
Now, for those of you that are used to using um, the mister, this is no doubt teaching you how to suck eggs. But for those of you that haven't seen this issue, um, it may be worth having a quick look at it. So what I've got here is a few different configurations. So by default, I'm booting into a 68020 AGA um, configuration with uh, Kickstart 3.2. Uh, 2 megs chip, 8 megs are fast, 1.5 megs are slow for what it's worth. Um, and it's also the uh, 3. or Amiga OS 3.2 image that it's going to boot from a hard drive um, file, HDF file. Okay, so that's the default. That's what we saw come up. Um, I've also got a fallback 314 image, but I'll probably get rid of that at some point. And then I've got another couple of configurations here. One for an OCS A500 with one meg of chip RAM using a Kickstart 1.3, and another one for uh, a 68020 AGA configuration with two megs of chip RAM using Kickstart 205. Okay, so because I know Buggy Boy is a very early game and it runs absolutely fine on a bog standard A500, um, that's what we're using this configuration for. So if I load that up, you'll see it'll come up with the uh, Kickstart 1.3 logo there with the floppy disk. And if we have a quick look at audio and video, you'll see that this is actually set up for NTSC because I suspect that um, this game was originally written for NTSC. Now it could be wrong, but either way, in many respects, it doesn't matter. The point being here that if we and then load up that image. I should say load up the game for Buggy Boy. Okay, there you go. I'll boot straight into that now. Okay, obviously this is a bog standard A500 plus a bit because uh, the FPGA does actually run slightly faster than a box down A500. But um, once it gets into it, hopefully it'll be worth the wait. <laughs> okay, there you go. So, that's it. Gets to the point where I can actually click through on the uh, on the joystick. And when I say joystick, I mean proper, you know, old school competition pro joystick. Okay, now the audio sounds a bit fast and that's because it's configured um, with NTSC, so the clock's a bit off. But once you get into the game, the gameplay is actually correct in terms of this, the speed that it runs at. And even though it's not utilizing quite the full screen, it's doing a considerably better job than it would have been had I had it configured for PAL. I mean, this is, this is playable. This is like running it on an A500. Um, if I were to spin up my my real genuine hardware based 68000 A500 and play the same game, it would be like this. And actually there's a little bit of blank space on that as well. So I'd say that was correct. Anyway, we'll, um, we'll come out of there. If we this time load up the configuration for the 68020 AGA with two megs of chip and the Kickstart 205 ROM. So again, we'll see it come up to the uh, the Kickstart splash screen. If we then load up an AGA game like Zool AGA, okay now you'll get a bit of um, oh, wait for it I was gonna say we get a bit of video corruption at some point I'm sure we will and again because we're running at NTSC it's going to sound. Uh, it's going. To, it's going to run a little faster than it should on the intro. But once we get through that, and we then 
Let's just tie that second disc. Floppy disks. <laughs> okay, but now the benefit is that is truly full screen and the response is absolutely awesome. Well, I've got to say, I've been playing this game for a good many years on and off, and the gameplay on this particular configuration is the, is the best I've ever known. Anyway, there you go, you get the idea. And one more, um, if we go back into the A500 configuration. Now I have the same thing with, um, with Xenon 2. If you run Xenon 2 using WHD Load and PAL, um, it typically doesn't fill the full screen. Now, if you're thinking, oh, well, I've tried this on a software emulator and I don't see any of these problems, you know what? Yeah, you're probably right. I've got the um, much the same configuration running actually under various software emulators, whether it's FSUAE or Amiberry or whatever, and quite often they will compensate. And typically they'll do a fairly good job of compensating and resizing the screen. Um, but the hardware-based Amiga won't and this won't either, so you need to kind of set it up the right way. And Xenon 2 is definitely one of those games where you tend to have problems where it doesn't fill the full screen. Or if you run it NTSC, it will fill the full screen, um, but it'll run too fast if you run it as a 68020 using WHD load. So I found the best way to do that is take, take it back to basics, go back, run it as an A500, except the fact that the intro might sound a little fast, um, but the gameplay is fantastic so let me just show you this quickly i know we're deviating a bit here but you know the whole point of building this machine was to to use it for for some of these games and some other apps as well but okay to demonstrate how well it's using the um, the available screen real estate. So let's just pop the second disc in there. Okay, but as you can see, it's, it's fairly well utilising the whole screen. So if we just go back in default configuration that'll take us back to Amiga OS 3.2 but um, hopefully if you were thinking oh well you know um, how are we going to play the games they're not coming up full screen or you know for those of you that have had problems running <coughs> running some games on on the mister that might be a workaround for you um, convenient as WHD load is doesn't always get it spot on in my experience so um, that's about it So there you go, one Amiga running on a Mr. FPGA inside 
uh, an Amiga A500 Plus uh, case uh, with a few extra bells and whistles um, and obviously having the uh, the party trick of being able to become pretty much any other any other core at will. Uh, so let's, well we had a look at the Arcades last time so let's have a look at Amateur PCW, there you go. That wasn't a good choice actually. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe go for the CPC, something that's ROM based. Okay, whatever it happens to be. Um, anyway, hopefully that was useful. So, what haven't we done yet? Um, the as it stands, I can't currently plug in my. Wait for it. Amiga Tank Mouse, uh, or I can, but it won't work. So obviously that's got a, a DP9 connector on the other end. Now, it's possible that at some point there'll be a firmware update available for the uh, Monster Joysticks adapters, uh, in which case I will reflash one of them so that I can use it with an Amiga mouse. Failing that, um, there are a couple of products available, um, one from a supplier in the Philippines, another one from a supplier in Canada, I believe, which basically do the same job. So they're DB9 connectors, and the firmware has been flashed to support um, an Amiga style mouse. Uh, Amiga mice, annoyingly, are neither serial uh, nor USB, obviously. Uh, they use effectively a proprietary protocol, so you need to have firmware to specifically support Amiga mice. Um, and basically, all I'm going to do initially is just plug it in. Um, to the USB interface on the back of the machine. By which point, you never know, the um, A500 Mini and the uh, USB flavor of the, uh, the tank mouse may be available, in which case, much easier just to grab one of those and plug it straight in, job done. Anyway, there you go, guys. That's um, that's pretty much it for now. I'll, uh, I'll keep you posted. I'll tell you briefly about one other project that I've got on the go. Um, yeah, it's another Amiga, I'm afraid. But this one, uh, even though it's a very similar project in many respects, you can see we're substituting the ports with uh, with USBs and HDMI. But this one's going to have, well, actually already does, have a, a, a Pi 4 installed on it. Uh, so that still needs a bit of work. Um, it's pretty much there. Got a few issues with the uh, the keyboard that need to be resolved. Uh, and in terms of the build, uh, it'll be Diet Pie with Ami Berry, which is very similar, in fact, to um, to a video that I did previously, a previous build um, on the Pi 400. Um, almost identical. The key difference is that we've got the um, the, the subtle hardware tweaks, um, and obviously it's in an Amiga case. Uh, other than that, uh, it's running Amiga OS uh, 3.2 but um, it's pretty much the same. And at some point, what I'll do is once both of these projects are complete, I will do a side-by-side -side comparison, showing you some of the pros and cons, uh, because there are some. So there's some things that the Pi with an emulator, software emulator, actually does better than the Mister, believe it or not. And there's plenty of things that the Mister does better than the Pi. So um, that might be, uh, might be worth a watch. Anyway, uh, that's it, guys. I will catch you on the next one. Take it easy.